Alaska through his work in the timber industry, through his work uh, just fostering economic development. Uh, his efforts are legendary, and John, John is always there. He's always bringing forth a point of view that says, let's find a way to develop our resources in Southeast Alaska. Let's have a healthy economy. Let's find a way for ourselves and for our kids and their kids to be able to live and work in this area. And so John was invited to give a perspective on the Tongass from his 40 plus years of, of working as a professional forester in the area. And so John, let's bring you up. Well, thank you. Um, I see enough people here who have uh, known me so long that uh, I'm going to have to be honest. <laughs> and uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to get with this group. Uh, uh, this is uh, one of my favorite meetings. Uh, and uh, I truly do believe that uh, uh, mining is, in fact, uh, the uh, real hope for uh, Alaska in the future. Uh, I, um, I've got some notes that I'm going to refer to periodically because I specifically want to cover several things, but let me bore you a few minutes with a, a little bit about my background. I am a country farm boy, uh, born and raised in western Washington state uh, in a small town of Buckley, actually only 1,100 people. I think there's still just 1,100 people there. Uh, there's more cows and animals and, uh, and then there are people. Uh, anyway, I was born in this, uh, this farm. My father worked for the White River Lumber Company, as did my older brother. So uh, I knew, uh, the, as the youngest of eight children, uh, that timber was it <laughs> from the standpoint of putting uh, uh, food on the table and having an economy and quality of life. Of course, being a farm boy, uh, we never were concerned in the Great Depression about uh, food, and uh, uh, my mother uh, uh, traded uh, milk and butter for bananas and oranges and things like that. Uh, but growing up uh, in the Great Depression, uh, I do have a great appreciation for the importance of uh, uh, of people having access to the resources and to develop those resources for the benefit of, uh, of all the people. I first came to Alaska in 1953, actually uh, 59 years ago this month. Um, <coughs> I was asked uh, if I would be in, I was doing some graduate work at the University of Montana, and uh, uh, I had a call and said, John, we want, we, we want to do a forest inventory of southeast Alaska uh, in, in 1953, and um, we'd like you to come and help work on that inventory. So uh, I uh, dropped out of um, graduate school and came up in, in, in the spring of 1953 and began with Harold Anderson to do an inventory of the Tongass and Chugach National Forests. Uh, and uh, I worked off the motor vessel Chugach for 76 days doing this inventory. And we uh, had complete aerial photo coverage of, the, of Southeast Alaska, uh, courtesy of the, uh, of the United States Navy. And uh, we did, uh, uh, a, a very thorough, statistically sound inventory of, of, of the resources of the Tongass National Forest. Uh, to my delight, uh, I discovered that, uh, and our analysis showed that uh, there was enough timber in southeast Alaska, even though only about a third of it was commercial, to, to actually be able to sustainably produce 800 million feet of timber uh, annually. 800 million feet of timber annually. That was, of course, before Alaska Native land selections and the state and community selections, that when it finally shook down, there was enough timber uh, when I became regional forester in 1976 to 84 to be able to produce sustainably every year 
450 million board feet of timber. This uh, photograph to the right is of the Ketchikan pulp mill, which was uh, uh, constructed in uh, 1951. And um, this mill, this mill uh, was really the first of what we, the Forest Service, had hoped would be several mills. Uh, the, 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 the ability to produce 450 million board feet of timber sustainably meant that there could be mills like this one at, Sit at Gatchikad at Sitka and also one at Wrangell. And there were plans to have, uh, the, uh, the, there was a mill in fact, uh, Alaska Pulp Corp Corporation, a Japanese uh, financed uh, mill that was built and uh, there was also a plan to be a pulp mill and a sawmill at Wrangell. The pulp mill never developed at Wrangell, but the, the sawmill did. Well, uh, there was also expectation that perhaps there could be a, a pulp mill on Admiralty Island, but uh, uh, Admiralty Island was uh, a candidate for to, to become uh, not just a, a a, a, a monument, but a park, and uh, I supported the position of, uh, of making Admiralty Island the national monument, uh, monument to uh, in, in, in opposition to the uh, proposal to make that a national park. National parks uh, were more restrictive, and I felt that uh, the uh, uh, the National Monument state status certainly preserved its uh, all of its values, but, but uh, made it more accessible to, to the people. Well, uh, I've got to tell a couple of stories uh, that that made me realize uh, after I became regional forester what a high-profile uh, forest the Tongass was and what interest it had from people who didn't even live in Alaska. And I had a telephone call <coughs> uh, uh, from a fellow who identified himself as uh, President Carter's uh, chief of staff. <coughs> and his name was Alexander Butterfield. Alexander Butterfield. And uh, I uh, <laughs> received this call and he said, this is Alexander Butterfield. I'm the chief of staff of President Carter, and I'd like to visit, if I could, a little bit about the Tongass National Forest. And I said, well, that's fine. Uh, I'll be glad to do that. He said, incidentally, he said, your name is Sandor, S-A-N-D-O-R? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I have a dog named Sandor. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, I'm sure he must be a well-behaved dog. <laughs> I said, I'm sure he's a good dog. <laughs> and he said, oh, he is a good dog, and he's very obedient. <laughs> Which, <laughs> you know, I'm not too slow to connecting dots. <laughs> And I said, well, I hope you don't expect me to be as obedient as your dog said. Or he says, no, but he said, I hope you can be cooperative. <laughs> he said, what we really do want to do, what President Carter wants to do, is to make sure that uh, the Tongass National Forest is uh, protected and preserved as much as possible in its natural state. And uh, can, can you be cooperative in that regard? Well, I said, I'm, you don't really understand the process by which we're developing plans for the, for the um, uh, future of the Tongass National Forest. I said, in, in, in 1976, the National Forest Management Act was passed, and by federal law, there's a very specific procedure by which 
National Forest Plans are developed. And I said, I'm, my sole responsibility is to see, uh, and since my plan will be the first one in the United States, that it very closely adheres to how the National Forest Management Act specifies the forest plans are to be prepared. So I thought I'm convening a very diverse group of people throughout the state of Alaska to develop this uh, plan and outline for the Tongass National Forest. I have no idea what the final plan will be. I said this group is going to be developing that plan. And so I said, uh, uh, um, that's just the way it is. <laughs> well, it wasn't long after that that I... Would you be more comfortable if I get you a chair? Yeah. I, it wasn't long after that um, that uh, 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 an interesting... Uh, thank you. Oh, what a relief. <laughs> What a relief. Uh, it wasn't long after that and a fellow uh, by the name of John Seiberling, uh, a, a congressman from Ohio, came up here and uh, asked me to show him around southeast Alaska. And he was uh, on the House Resources Committee and uh, oh, I got me we had a plane take us around southeast Alaska and he said to me and the pilot I want to spend a week in southeast Alaska looking at all the potential mines, hydroelectric power sites and every area that could possibly be developed and uh, uh, in, in southeast Alaska and he said, uh, I want to make it clear up front that it's my objective to make certain that as much of Southeast Alaska as possible will be preserved from any form of development. I said, what? <laughs> he said, I want to make certain that uh, as much of Southeast Alaska's resources as possible be preserved from de development. And I said, well, that's in complete contradiction of the National Forest Management Act and in complete contradiction of what we're supposed to be doing. And he says, uh, yeah, I'm simply telling you that President Carter and I and the majority of us want the Tongass National Forest to be preserved from development. And I said, well, if you want to do that, why don't you propose a national park? And he says, well, we've tried that, and, and uh, that's not acceptable. Uh, that Senator Stevens is an absolute bear on that subject. <laughs> he, 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 we can't get took first base with Senator Stevens. He's protecting you know, the Tongass and he insists that the Tongass be available for use. And I said, isn't that great? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, you're really not very cooperative, probably. And well, anyway, this went on and on. Uh, it gets down to the, and I see several ladies in the room, but uh, it's all some, somewhat, uh, reluctant to say this, but in the, in the spirit of honesty, I'm going to tell you exactly like it is. <clears throat> it was Christmas, uh, the, the week before Christmas, and John McGuire, the chief of the Forest Service, <clears throat> got a call from John Cyberling, and uh, uh, this is Christmas 59 years ago, he, he says, Chief, um, I want that regional forester, a regional administrator, or whatever the hell he is, I want his balls nailed to the barnyard door. <laughs> and uh, so, John McGuire said, 
well, what's wrong, Mr. Seibel? And uh, he said, well, I spent the whole week uh, of my valuable time traveling throughout Southeast Alaska, trying to explain to this, uh, this person how the Tongass is to be managed and what needs to be protected. And, uh, and, and, and he says, it's amazing to me how unresponsive a person can be. He says, this guy doesn't even know who the president is. He doesn't realize that President Carter wants these things and President Carter should be able to get these things. What can we do to make this region of Forrester more responsive? And John McGuire said, well, Mr. Seibel, you don't understand. There's a process that the National Forest Management Act requires that for planning, and he is methodically following this. And this diverse team of people uh, will be working over the next uh, six months developing the, the, the Tongass plan, a variety of options, and there will, will be a National Environmental Policy Act uh, analysis of each of the alternatives, and, uh, and uh, that will be the way this plan is developed. I've got to really tell you, in retrospect, how fortunate it is that we had that National Forest Environmental Policy Act and that how fortunate it is that we had that National Forest Management Act that, that really protected uh, uh, administrators from around the country to be able to administer um, uh, the, the forest to, in accordance with law as opposed to the whims of, um, of, uh, of, of politicians who had access to grind or, or uh, money to make uh, or, or whatever else. So, so I, <laughs> I, I, I look back on that uh, time as, a, as an interesting one of, um, of um, uh, I guess just a way in which a person shouldn't be naive and not thinking that, that those interest groups that have things at stake uh, are, are understandably going to be trying to make things happen their way, but fortunately there's a process by which uh, uh, the public uh, can look at the various alternatives for weighing national forests, there can be an analysis, and there has to be a social, economic, and environmental analysis of all the alternatives, and uh, the, the decisions that are finally made uh, are the ones that best reflect what the people of, um, want to do. So that gets me to the point of, of, of where we uh, ended up with the Tongass Land Plan of 1976. I asked Gene Millard, <laughs> because I no longer can lay my hands on the, the Tongass Land Management Plan, I asked Gene if he could get me a copy of this uh, uh, plan, and he's, he said he'd drop one by the house. So, um, I don't remember the details of the, of the plan, but um, uh, but I really was interested in knowing. But you are what you what is going on in in in, in Southeast Alaska today is not what was envisioned in that 1976 plan, as you know. Uh, uh, the forces at play uh, uh, in. In, in, in Congress and in the various administrations that come by, um, override what um, what can be done. But the, the alternatives are all laid out. Uh, so, wh wh what what is it that we have on the Tongass today, from the standpoint of of, um, of timber production? Actually, um, uh, it, it is a sad commentary that during the 1880 to 19 I was digging out the um, uh, the reports of how, what industries there were in southeast Alaska, and there were eight sawmills, actually water power-driven water power sawmills. 
uh, half of them were native and half non-native. Uh, uh, six sawmills. Uh, uh, it looks like a cedar mill also at Ketchikan. Today we have a Viking sawmill at um, Kolak. And, uh, and that's it. And, and it is an, an amazing uh, circumstance that this huge forest that we have, 16 million acre forest, a third of which is commercial, that uh, we can only have one sawmill. And those, there's a few here that are here when we had a plywood plant in June. And, um, and, 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 and it just um, seems to me um, tragic that um, that a renewable resource, a renewable resource as forests are, cannot be sustainably managed to produce, to produce jobs and to produce products and to produce an economy and a quality of life that is sustainable, completely sustainable. Uh, Unfortunately, um, in your perspective on this is, 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 is good or better than mine, but I, th I think <laughs> we suffer to some degree from the luxury of the oil wealth that we have, which covers, I think still covers about 60 to 70 to maybe 75 percent of all costs of, of Alaska state and you know, local governments. Uh, and so we don't really need timber. We don't really need to, to harvest timber. We've got the oil, can, as long as the oil continues to flow, we don't really need to, to look to timber. But uh -huh. how much longer can the oil flow to the level that it's now flowing? I'm told and I don't know. You, uh, people in this room will know better, more than I that the the, the flow through the Alaska oil pipeline is diminishing, and I don't know whether it's 70, 75, 60, whatever percent, but it's diminishing. Of course, there's new fields that are being developed, and, uh, 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 and drilling is underway as we speak, and, and so I'm sure oil will, uh, uh, new sources of oil will, uh, will be developed. But I, I, I guess what I'm, uh, what I guess I would wonder and would really think it might be interesting to have some discussion about this, of, of what, how can we really make our economy more diverse and how can we can revitalize uh, forest products industries in Southeast Alaska to uh, to uh, actually uh, enable the people to benefit by this resource. So, uh, I have some notes. Earlier this year, um, Secretary of Agriculture Vilsack um, announced that, um, and I don't know, Gene, uh, uh, if this is really true or not, uh, but it was said that Secretary Vilsack withdrew the authority of the Forest Service to make timber sales and and uh, develop road projects on the Tongass National Forest uh, 
they could recommend them, but that the Secretary of Agri Agriculture, Secretary Vilsack himself, or his deputy, Under Secretary Sherman, had to specifically approve any any timber sales or any road projects on the Tongass National Forest. And, uh, I uh, I don't know whether uh, um, uh, that was never published in the Federal Register. Or at least I could not find it in the Federal Register, and uh, because I was curious that um, uh, you know that this was such in such contradiction to the National Forest Management Act that I, I would think that the congressional delegation would pounce on that immediately and. And, and so uh, I assume that that is, is his policy, is his wish, and I don't even know that, um, uh, and of course this is a, a national issue, the Tongass is, uh, is, is an Alaska issue, but if the Secretary of Agriculture wants to, run the Department of Agriculture that way, that's the way it's going to be run. And I do not know uh, what the... Uh, I know that the Congress Land Management Plan of 2006 has, a, uh, uh, has the ability and the target of producing uh, a little over 200 million board feet of timber a year in timber sales has that authority to do that, over two, just a little over 200 to 225 million board feet of timber. When I asked uh, how much timber sales are actually being offered, I was told about 25 or less than 50 million. Is that in the ballpark? That's in the ballpark, and the harvest is around 20 million. Yeah. So, there you have it, my friends. There you have it. A forest. Excuse me, John. Yeah. As you alluded to the, uh, the policy of uh, the delegation going back to the secretary, I don't know about for timber sales, for minerals, that is the case. Uh, for uh, any kind of proposals on roadless, on roadless uh, designated. You, you know, I have no information Well, yeah, I'm glad thanks for pointing that out. Um, isn't it true, though, that, um, that um, uh, and I think this is a good thing in, in many respects, uh, isn't it true, though, that regardless of what the secretary wants to do, uh, all of the Tongas is open to mineral entry. Ex well, everything that's not removed from mineral entry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well I mean, except for except for the uh, that the, the the mining laws apply to the, the Tongas National Forest. Uh, sure. Yeah. About about 60% of the Tongass National Forest is still open to even after the wilderness is such a I believe I recall that for a second. Well, anyway, this gets to the, uh, this gets to the point of um, what role or what what, as we look to 2013 and uh, the future years of this decade, especially in Southeast Alaska, which, um, as um, we all know, has had a has had a very stable population. I think there was a slight increase uh, in, in the population of Juno in uh, in um, this past year. But for the most part, Southeast Alaska's population is is still running right around 69, 70,000, uh, and has been that way for 
for most of the last decade. And as we look to, to the future of, in Southeast Alaska, what, what can we see? What can we hope for? What can we plan for? What should we plan for? And this is what I really wanted to do for. I got three minutes left. <laughs> it's, it's to be with you. Let's start. How can we, how can we, Alaska Miners Association, Alaska uh, Society, American Foresters, the, you know, the different organizations that's interested in the resources of, of Southeast Alaska, how can we make sure that the resources of um, of the Tongass National Forest are available for the communities and residents of Southeast Alaska to improve their economy, quality of life. Uh, how can we do this? And it seems to me that what I'd like to see ha happen uh, is that this Association, this Alaska Miners Association, and the other organizations interested in resource management work with the delegation, uh, congressional delegation, and Governor Parnell and Lieutenant Governor Lee Treadwell in, um, in making certain that Secretary Vilsack's uh, modus rule uh, is, is, uh, is eliminated. Fortunately, Governor Parnell and Governor <coughs> Treadwell are opposed, openly opposed to that, and in fact, litigation has been filed in opposition to that modus rule declaration. Any, are there any, that's a, a view of mine, are there any questions or any comments? First off, John, we really appreciate you taking the and what was it, it, lands originally slated for responsible and managed development and we lost our, our way at some point in time uh, under various uh, administrations and rulemakers and, and, and now with, with that perspective looking forward you know, we, we, we are really charged with finding ways to work with all of the people you mentioned to, to foster additional development it's not, not an easy path it's something that's been debated around these tables on Friday mornings as long as I've, I've been around and much longer uh, as, as you've been around over the years. But, but John, we truly appreciate those perspectives and if there's questions or comments from the floor, I'd be good to get some of those out now. John. Uh, first off, uh, I'm amazed that the Forest Service has done as well as they have in cleaving to the original program. It's been chopped up and still is. I first met John in 1962, and we were adversarials. I was a raper and a plunder of the road networks built in for the Falcons. We put a lot into the economy, and it's the first time that I ever saw three beavers come into a town or into a logging camp and uh, I've watched what's happened, and what you're saying is true. It is happening. On the other hand, people change, personnel change. But by and large, John, it's in the heart of what you people did way back when. But I don't know how, because of the population, etc., etc. I do not know how, and our representatives can make this felt. But they better damn well, because pretty quick you are going to be able to get on the night. And it's, uh, you, you have done a good job of doing what you might not agree with you, but you've done a good job with the tools that you have. I just would like to hope that those tools stay in effect and are not completely run out of the president's office. No, I'm glad you said that. And, and for those who may not have heard, 
what he said was really what an extraordinary job, a good job the Forest Service people were doing. I, I really admire uh, regional forester Pat Pendleton and the administrations. The Forest Service's steadfast adherence to uh, the professional management of the forest, in spite of the, in spite of the political pressures that are imposed on them, uh, they're doing, uh, they're really doing a very effective uh, job and, and are to be commended. I thank you for pointing that out. Uh, any other comments? Sure. John, would you consider writing a book about the rise and fall of the Tongass National Forest? I couldn't write a book about the rise and fall of the... because it isn't going to fall. <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, I... You know, uh, politicians come and go when... Uh, when... Uh, when, when this character from Ohio, John Sullivan, uh, called the uh, chief of the forest service and wanted my testicles nailed to the barnyard door, uh, I I thought that was was really a sign of weakness uh, and uh, and as well as arrogance uh, and th these politicians come and go. But the, the really important thing is that, that we have a professional staff in mining, in timber, in wildlife, in fisheries uh, that keep the forest running. And that's the way we have to, uh, to uh, be on guard to make sure that continues. Uh, because the best, the best forms of management come when people who live and work on the ground and in the nearby communities determine what the people would like, what the resources can, can, uh, uh, can provide and sustainably provide and, and, and administer the forest based on those scientific purposes and objectives as opposed to political purposes and objectives. Thank you very much. Yes, Brad. Um, John, with no disrespect to the Forest Service, but it appears to this person that it's the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that manages the Tongass. <laughs> and so, in your time frame, how do you, when did the courts become the managers of the Tongass, and how did we get them out of the management of the Tongass? You know, that is really a brilliant, and that really trumps everything I said. <laughs> It, it, it is true. It's true. The Ninth Circuit and, and the judges um, override what 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 can happen. What can happen? And I guess it, I guess the, my only response to that is is that hopefully those overrides by the, the judiciary. Uh, are uh, as minimal as as they can be because uh, they're generated essentially by special interest groups on one or both sides or all sides of issues, and uh, it's just a part of the of the balance of power between uh, uh, the executive and, and judiciary. But I I submit. I submit that uh, it's the local communities that can work with the Miners Association, the foresters, the wildlife biologists in de determining what's best for the people and what's best for the resources. And you're right, um, courts overrule, but um, uh, I think um, I think looking back on these 60, 50 million years uh, uh, that, you know, there's, there's a map on the wall of the mines in, in Alaska. I, I, isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing how, uh, <coughs> how, how this forest can produce 
the resources from the mines that have offset the, the loss of the economy from the clo closure of the forest products industry and a tribute to Jerry and all of the miners, uh, Kensington, uh, Greens Creek, uh, um, and you know, if it wasn't for the, if it wasn't for the mines, if it wasn't for the mines in Southeast Alaska, our economy would be, would really be facing a, uh, a, a bad future, but I think the future uh, uh, is bright. And it's bright because of, of, of mining. And it's bright because uh, there's still the authority to be able to uh, seek, locate, and develop minerals. So, uh, yeah, Carlton? You, you mentioned earlier uh, in your presentation the Native Claim Settlement Act, a little bit in passing. Uh, why don't we have the collective leadership of all of the Native corporations in Southeast? Why don't we have them more forcefully uh, a player in, in the mining going forward? Do you see that in potential? I, uh, that, that, that certainly ought to be examined, but I'm not, I'm not um, uh, well versed or, or knowledgeable enough about the uh, uh, the, the uh, Alaska Native Claim, or Na 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 Alaska Native Organization's uh, uh, role in operations to to get things done. I've marveled uh, at Sea Alaska's ability to do things on their lands, going down with Ron Wolf on Prince of Wales Island and see what they've been doing. Uh, it's been a blessing, frankly, that the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act led to the conveyance of those lands to the native and to, to, to the state. I, I applaud Governor Parnell and so efforts to, through Chris Mason, state forester, to increase the size of these state forest lands in southeast Alaska to a million acres to make, to actually use that million acres to demonstrate how that can be effectively managed to produce uh, uh, you know, to produce uh, products. Uh, any other comments or questions? Well, John, we truly appreciate your perspectives on, on the Tongass and economic development and your optimism on mining in the area. And we appreciate you taking the time to, to share that with us today. So.